Hi, I'm Bob Ferguson. Thank you for watching this tape. We'd like to share with you today the strategy we have for the company, the impacts it will have on many of you as we move our operations from one portion of the country to another. We'd also like to talk to you about some of the operational problems we've had in the past as we've spoken in the past. In particular, many of you are aware that we have produced miserable baggage performance, miserable on-time performance, many complaints, to bring a new focus to the operational portions of the company, we've hired a new individual, Gordon Bethune, who will join us as president. In fact, he did join us two months ago as president. And he joins us from Boeing and Piedmont, where he's had a lot of experience in making these kinds of things work. I'd like to introduce you at the moment to Gordon Bethune. Hey, thanks, Bob. Uh, I, I really <clears throat> I appreciate that warm welcome, too. Thank you for uh, meeting with us today. I just wanted to take a minute, because I've been here two months, and you know uh, all these guys that are expert after two months, but I do have some first impressions, and I thought maybe I'd share them with you. One, our company, Con Airlines, has a good strategic plan, unlike a whole lot of companies. And I've got to tell you, from my observations, at Boeing over the last five years, we get to look at all the airlines all over the world. Who's doing what? Who's got the performance and who doesn't? And from my perspective, the only airline out there really doing something about the changing marketplace was Continental. So I believe in that. And as Bob may have mentioned to you, he said he and I go back some 14 years. And so I know firsthand that we've got the right leadership in this company to execute this plan. So there's no question in my mind that we're on the right track and we got the right guy at the helm. And I guess more important than all of that is that we're well positioned as a company to take advantage of this change in the marketplace that we see out there. The marketplace is asking for, as demanding, low cost, high value transportation. And they don't have that today and I think we're uniquely positioned to do that. And I guess they really want that plus safe, yet frequent, and then read dependable point-to-point -point transportation. So I think we've got a ways to improve on those things, but uniquely Continental is in that position. The other thing I've noticed, and since I've been here, is that we have a really good and professional workforce. Uh, many of you I've seen over the last couple of months are willing to go that extra mile. I've seen that at the airports and on, in flight as we fly around the system, and even at the headquarters building, the AGC. People are, in fact, willing still here at Continental to do that extra effort to make that program pay, to make that passenger happy, or to make that a better flight for somebody. And that's really encouraging to me. Uh, the other thing I'd have to say is that we have a very technically competent workforce. I know from my technical background at the Boeing Company that we often get to judge the technical competence of the people who operate Boeing airplanes. And without doubt, the ETOPS, Long Range Certification Program, that Continental has developed for introduction of the 5767 airplanes is without peer in the industry. Matter of fact, Boeing has used it as a model for other airlines to use in when they want to introduce new airplanes. So that's really good. Then you look at our fleet plan. And we have a stream of airplanes that we need to implement this strategic initiative or this strategic plan. And I was more than gratified to learn that you were buying them from the right company, and I also endorse in the maker of all these airplanes that we are, in fact, getting. They're the things we need. The bigger issue, I guess, now facing all of us is that operationally we're not working real well together. I think we have a lot of virtuosos in play individually, their roles, but we lack that orchestration and teamwork that's needed to execute a very complex system. And as we move from west to east in our flying, and we uh, really change the nature of our business, we need to stay tied together in the way we implement the new flying plan. So my put is that we will work better together in getting some orchestration of the flight schedule before it's printed and some buy-in from those of you at the airports and on the airplanes and the people in the catering business and all of those things, the parts of the watch that have to work to say that, yes, this is the plan and we'll stick to it. And I think we can do that, and we've got an effort underway. At Newark, we focused early on there, and we put our best management team in place to fix Newark with the guarantee that if they need our help, 
we're willing to stand by with the resources. So we need to fix Newark to get our whole system running better, and we need to orchestrate our flying schedule so that the summer schedule is one that we can anticipate problems and, and execute smartly. So I think those are the two things we need to do, and I, that's going to be my focus here over the next six to eight months is getting us working together as a team and getting this airline on time. I'm looking forward to working with each one of you in the future because I know that working together, we can make continental tops in the industry. Thanks for listening. Thanks, Gordon. And what we thought we'd do now is talk to you a little bit about the strategy on where we're going and then a little bit about uh, some of the things that are going to happen. Initially, we should start with customer preference and specifically with the right product. The right product is valued by our customer, i.e. something that they're prepared to pay for. We need to fly to the right places at the right times and with an appropriate amount of frequencies. We need to deliver our product more efficiently. We need to do it consistently and reliably, as mentioned by Gordon, and as many of us are aware, we have not done in the past. And we must do it at a competitive price. A competitive price is to say one that somebody is prepared to pay. Right product is valued by our customer. Examples of it, expanded business first in the DC-1010 fleet, primarily at Air Micronesia, which will provide consistency across the Pacific and across the Transcon marketplace. We're gonna upgrade our first class service on key domestic routes, about 30 city pairs, where there are actually people who will pay for a higher quality product. That will essentially be the implementation of, of service evolution as it has been refined. We will upgrade first class service and coach service to Latin America, both, with added frequency to Mexico City, upgrades of local airport facilities, and if you have been in Mexico or Central America, you need we know that we need a little bit of upgrade in those facilities, and substantial improvements to both the first class and the coach meal service in those markets. Finally, we'll provide complimentary drinks in both the transatlantic and Latin American markets because our insane competitors decided to give it away. We're gonna try and increase our revenues through market dominance. Specifically, we're gonna focus our flying where Continental can be dominant, and we're gonna redeploy assets away from markets in which we are a follower. One question one might have is, why would one do so? And the answer is fairly straightforward. We'll try and cover it here in a moment. <clears throat> On September 29th last year, if you were gonna travel between Greensboro and Baltimore, you had a choice of one air carrier and one routing, and needless to say, they picked out what price you would pay, and that's the price you paid. If, however, on the same day, you wanted to travel between Greensboro and Los Angeles, some 2,300 miles, you could pick any one of six air carriers. There were 25 different ways that you could make that trip in terms of the routing, and there are exactly 57 passengers per day in that marketplace. Needless to say, nobody has price control in that marketplace. And that's illustrative of what's happened since 1978. In long-haul markets, yields have declined as much as 40% vis-a-vis cost, and in short-haul markets, they're as much as 30% higher than our costs. The opportunity today is in the short-haul part of the marketplace for us and everyone else. The reason you try and achieve dominance, and dominance really means that you have more frequency than your competitor, is because if you have dominance, you get paid about 4% more than the industry average fare in that marketplace. If you don't have dominance, you will be paid about 12% less than the industry average fare. That largely explains why Continental's yields continue to be below those expected. And this chart illustrates it more graphically. If you look at the blue and the purple color, you'll notice those are the positions where people are leaders. And the green and pink color, or orange, are the positions where people are followers. If you take a look at this, you'll see that Southwest Airlines is a leader in about 90% of the markets in which it participates. Continental Airlines, where the third from the right, is a leader in about 45% of the markets in which we participate or phrased a little differently, in 55% of the markets in which we participate, we receive a sub-industry yield for the transportation we provide. The goal then, is fairly simply stated, 
to move Continental from a position where we're a follower to a position where we're a, a leader. And what happens is you start to realize yields that are premium to the industry. The single largest problem of Continental in the past has been and continues to be generating sufficient revenue for the activity that we produce. In order to figure out where you can be dominant, however, you have to find some people. And <clears throat> this particular chart shows a line drawn roughly between Chicago and Texas. And if you look to the right of that line or eastward, you will notice that the vast majority of the large cities in America are to the east. To the west, there is a paucity of large cities and or population bases. The other thing that's noteworthy about the line is that if you look to the east of it, there's about 35% of the land mass of the US, 70% of the population, and more than 70% of the wealth in the whole nation. Our focus then will be to the east of that line for our domestic operations. Cal Light, a product we developed about a year ago and began implementing last October, has resulted in a dramatic shift of resources from Denver to Cal Light flying, resulting in significant improvement in our market dominance. Revenue performance in the new markets is considerably ahead of our plan, both in terms of passengers and in terms of absolute yield. The competitive reaction has been significant, and happily, it is also exactly as we predicted it would be. We plan to continue to pursue aggressive market expansion to reach sufficient critical mass and allow proper flow of passengers, and finally to absorb aircraft from low yield markets. Specifically, Cal Light began on the 1st of October. We served initially 173 cities, excuse me, 173 daily departures, 14 cities. We used 19 aircraft, and it was a tiny percentage of our system, about 4%. On March 9th, we went to 584 daily departures. We served 26 cities, we used 68 aircraft, and it achieved 17% of the domestic activity of Continental. March 9 root structure, it wouldn't be a surprise to you to see that primarily that root structure is to the east of the line that went from Chicago to Texas. That's where most of our activity has been and will continue to be. In addition, with March 9, schedule and following on with our July schedule <coughs> or the summer of 1994, we will introduce larger cities into the Continental Light system, <coughs> specifically increased business markets. By and large, we have chosen small cities to date, and we will try and introduce larger cities to the process. Greensboro will become a high productivity, high connectivity city. Greensboro will become for us the equivalent of Love Field for Southwest Airlines. We will enhance our ability to reaccommodate passengers when things don't go right, and in some cases they clearly haven't gone right to date, and we will fine tune the existing schedule. Summer schedule, 708 daily departures, 45 cities, 86 aircraft, and now 28% of the domestic system. Cal Light is getting larger, is getting larger very quickly, and is going to force us to change. The route map looks about like the last route map. You'll see a few lines extending now into the west. Those lines are actually not per se Cal Light, but are, in fact, individual aircraft routings where 20-minute turns and things exist. But most of the activity is clearly to the right of our line. What happens to our market dominance? The same chart we looked at a minute ago, you'll see that we were over there on the right, third from the right, 45% dominant. When we complete the Cal Light system, Continental will dominate in about 70% of the markets it participates. It will be second only to Southwest in terms of market dominance and ahead of all of the rest of the air carriers. So we are, in fact, achieving that which we set out to achieve. The challenges? Challenges are many. 
We are obviously implementing system-wide changes ahead of our competition. That's where we need to be. We're achieving aircraft, crew, and station productivity, unlike we have achieved in any other portion of our system in the past. And we must reduce our costs. Our costs must be competitive. An example of productivity improvements, average gate utilization. Our system was about 4.1 turns per gate prior to the introduction of Cal Light. We need to get to 9.5 turns per gate per day in order to achieve the productivity that Cal Light anticipates. Block hours for aircraft will go from about 10.2 to about 11.3, about a 10% improvement. More interestingly, all of that improvement is in the daylight hours when people actually wish to fly, as opposed to flying in the middle of the night, which is the traditional way of increasing aircraft productivity. To do so, to deliver service more efficiently, we need better crew scheduling. It is not going to be lost on any of you that our crew scheduling at the moment is at the lowest point it's been in many, many years. That needs to be corrected, and it will be corrected. We need to produce more departures per gate and more departures per city to maximize the value of our leaseholds. We need to invest in some technology to allow people to process people more efficiently. This happens to be a chart which illustrates airline costs in relation to their stage length, i.e. the average trip made by an airplane. What it shows is that typical airline, ourselves included, at 1,250 miles you can produce a seat mile at about 7 cents a mile, and around 250 miles your costs are around 17 and a fraction cents. That is pretty much typical of Continental's system. Cal Light, if we did nothing other than what we do today, and we simply shortened our stage length, would produce increased costs of some $750 million. Those costs would eventually doom Continental to any possibility of success. This particular chart shows why we're changing. Southwest Airlines is there to the left. Southwest Airlines is notable for its productivity. It's not notable for the fact that it pays its employees poorly. It doesn't. It pays its employees roughly 50% more than we pay our employees, or two-thirds of what the other guys pay. But nevertheless, Southwest is uniquely productive, and they don't fit on the line. They don't fit on the curve at all. They are, in fact, unique in that respect. It is that uniqueness that we must capture. We must capture their ability to maximize the number of turns on a gate, the number of trips per city, the number of hours productively worked for each person who comes to work at all. It is that very nature which will allow us to succeed. America West is our domestic alliance. It gets more play than it deserves. The goal is to strengthen continental system to the West, to the cities that we may or may not serve in the future. We're investing some $20 million in America West for a 5% interest in the company. No merger is planned with America West. No merger is contemplated with America West. In fact, no consolidation of the two companies at all is contemplated. We will not have any seats on their board of directors. We will have, have any management interchanges between the two companies. We expect to get our money back in about 12 months, plus a profit. And of course, we will continue to own 5% of America West. What is it we expect to do with America West? <laughs> we expect to perform an extensive co-chairing agreement. We expect that we'll have joint frequent flyer programs and marketing arrangements, and that we will have combined purchasing. Internationally, about 30% of our operations are conducted internationally. Specifically, they're conducted in Guam and Saipan, and primarily to Japan, the north-south corridor there. That's Air Mike. Air Mike is essentially the leisure carrier of choice of the Japanese tourist. The next most important area is Central America and South America, area where we have traditionally been profitable. We continue to be profitable in our services there, and where we have an opportunity to be much larger than we are today. We will at least initially focus on Mexico City, it wouldn't be a surprise to you to find out that Mexico City is large. What might be a surprise to you to find out how large it really is. Houston to Dallas, an interesting route, 73 daily trips per day 
flown in that marketplace. Houston to Mexico City, 10 daily trips flown in that marketplace each day. Mexico City is twice as large as Dallas in terms of people who have the wealth to actually buy airline tickets. Needless to say, there is a significant shortage of capacity in that marketplace. Finally, Europe, traditionally a profitable marketplace for us. Today it is not. That is not a surprise. It's not a surprise when you have 12 percent unemployment in each of the four countries that we fly to, that the people are not spending money. Nevertheless, long-term strategic value, clear. We have one route that's disappointing as a P&L matter, and that is Munich, and we will address Munich as to how we're going to serve it. Uh, more effectively here in a little bit. 94 outlook. We expect that the first quarter will report a significant loss. And when I say a significant loss, I'm talking about roughly nine figures. There continue to be weak industry yields. There has been poor weather. Poor weather to the extent that we operated about 93, 94 percent of the airline in the months of January and February, the first part of March. For those of you from the Northeast, you know only too well the problems of the weather in the Northeast. Rough justice, we should have flown 98 to 99 percent of the airlines, so we're about five percentage points short, five percent of 400 million a month, roughly 20 million dollars, attributable to the weather each month. We have an aircraft modification program, and so we have about 15 aircraft out of service during the course of the winter, and that costs you money. We have restructuring costs. We've been moving our system from one part of the country to another, and that costs money. So those costs will be recorded to the largest extent possible in the first quarter. And for better or worse, our costs continue to be extraordinarily high, primarily because we have not yet fully implemented Cal Light in terms of the system and the procedures necessary to allow it to generate the productivity, which will cause our costs to fall. Performance should improve throughout the balance, 1994. Full year results, we still expect will be a loss, although we do expect that we will break even, and in fact, I will tell you personally, I expect to make money in the second half of 1994. Finally, improvement in our financial results will require dramatic changes in our operations. Cal Light flying must be fully implemented, and it must prove ultimately to be successful. Certainly, there's no reason at the moment to believe that that cannot be done. Denver right-sizing will continue. And greater operating efficiencies must be achieved. Only by completely restructuring Continental can we achieve profitability. We also thought we'd talk to you about the actions that are underway at the moment. The Denver hub will be reduced to 86 jet flights this summer from approximately 99 at the moment. Commuter operations in Denver will also be reduced significantly. Crew bases for jets in Denver will be dramatically reduced once again. For purposes of the various pilot and flight attendants who have to move, we are going to treat the reductions in Denver as if we were closing the bases, although we are in fact not closing the bases. We will do that for anyone who has moved as of January 1st this year and forward. And Continental Express is being evaluated for restructuring or sale. Other actions underway, closure of three jet stations and seven commuter stations in the summer of 1994. All of those stations will be closed, effective with the June-July schedule change. In addition, all ATRs will be transferred out of Denver by October, with the possible exception of two ATR 72s. Four city operations have already been transferred to GP Express effective as of the March 9th schedule. Those were Amarillo, North Platte, Pueblo, and Scotts Bluff. Negotiations are underway for the following cities, which are targeted to be closed, for potential transfer to code-sharing partners. Specifically, the cities are Durango, Gunnison, Montrose, Rapid City, Casper, Cheyenne, Cody, Gillette, Jackson Hole, Riverton, Rock Springs, and Sheraton essentially the commuter operations in Denver, with the exception of about five stations. Other actions underway through attrition or furlough. Over the course of the remainder of the year, 1,000 employees will no longer be with us. 
Management ranks will be reduced by 7%. Non-management ranks will be reduced by about 2%. Flight attendant staffing generally will be reduced to three, concurrent with a change in the narrow body meal service that we will be providing. Food service will be rationalized, specifically with the exception of three or four markets. No meals will be served on flights shorter than two and a half hours. The flight service manager position will be phased out primarily through attrition. Certain maintenance operations will be outsourced. JT8D engine and landing gear operations will be outsourced over the next several months. Component shops will relocate out of Denver and Los Angeles in the next two years. Chelsea will experience staff reduction due to reduced meal activity, commensurate with those changes in each of the stations. Aircraft and component base maintenance location, we will announce a decision this summer. It will either be in Houston or Atlanta. We're negotiating with the cities to see which one will provide us more goodies. Flight training building, two bay expansion undergoing right now, 737 EFIS cockpits, and A300, which is a transfer from Miami to Houston. An additional expansion will occur in 1995 as we take additional aircraft types. Flight crew utilization, a subject of much consternation, both to you and to me. 737s, we currently fly about five hours a day. We would expect that the flight crew utilization on that aircraft will rise to five hours and 30 to five hours and 40 minutes per day. DC-9s go from 446 to five and a half. MD-8727s from five minutes and 10, yeah, five hours and 10 minutes, five hours and a half to five hours and 45 minutes, and the A300 from five and a half hours to about six hours per day. Long and short effect of that is that flight crews should wind up being able to put in the number of hours required to be worked each month more quickly, thereby producing more days off in each month. Potential crew base for the fall, we're looking at crew bases in Chicago Midway, Tampa Orlando, and Jacksonville, Florida. Other actions underway, we're going to improve the buddy pass policy. We're going to reinstate the service pin programs that we've had in the past. We're going to reinstate company picnics, which we have had in the past. We're also going to uh, implement a program. We have a, a in-company uh, charity that we would ask each of you to support and hope you do, which is called We Care. We Care collects money primarily from employees for distribution to other employees who have medical emergencies or earthquakes or, or the like. In the past, it's had a fairly uh, decent amount of money in it. Money was available for people in true need. Uh, the Los Angeles earthquake uh, consumed about $140,000 of those monies. The company's going to contribute $200,000 to We Care to reinstitute the bank. And I would encourage each of you, if you don't otherwise, to make a contribution to We Care. You can do it through payroll deduct. A dollar a month even would be significant. We're going to grant to the employees of the company, employees below the level of director, restricted stock. Restricted stock is essentially an ownership interest in the company. We're going to grant about a million shares of stock to the employees. It's about 4% of the ownership of Continental Airlines. It's worth about $20 million. That grant will be one time in nature. It will apply to all full and part-time employees of Continental, including Express, System One, and Chelsea. The amount to be received by each employee is going to be based 50% on the fact that you're an employee, providing you were an employee on December 31st, 1993 and also an employee on March 4th, 1994, and 50% based on the amount of the pay cut that you experience. No employee will receive, however, less than 20 shares, um, irrespective of how they qualify in the program. We would expect the maximum to be received by any given employee will be about 100 shares. And for directors and above, we will have a stock option plan, which will grant those individuals who are affected rights to purchase stock at a fixed price. We will also have a 401k plan pursuant to which the company will match up to $300 of any employee's contributions based on the company's financial performance in any given year. Finally, we'll have a stock purchase plan 
pursuant to which each employee will be entitled to buy stock of the company at a 15% discount from its market price without tax effect on that 15%. On June 30, 1994, we will restore the final 25% pay cut that had taken effect in July of 1992. Further, on July 1st, 1994, we will make 2% of each employee groups of total pay available for wage increases for that group. We will individually meet the respective leadership of your employee group to determine exactly how to allocate that pay. On December 1st, 1994, we will restore half of the longevity that was lost in the period between November and June of 1994. And finally, we will restore the remaining half of longevity on March 31st, 1995. Effectively, what all this translates into is a 13.5% raise for the average employee at Continental Airlines over the next 12 months. Finally, we will implement a profit-sharing plan. The company will contribute to the employees 15% of any pre-tax profits that it earns. Those profits, for the benefit of those of you who are skeptics, will be audited by our accountants so that there won't be any debate about that. Be allocated based on your salary. It will be payable four months after the close of any given year. Summary, our strategic plans have been developed and are being implemented. Not only have they been developed and are they being implemented, they are being much praised. They are much praised by people like Wall Street, they're much copied by people like United Airlines and Delta Airlines and U.S. Air, all of whom are trying to figure out how to do what we're doing. Our financial performance will improve. It will improve considerably as we implement our strategy. Action is now required in order to succeed. The action that is required is that all of us must work together. We all must pull in the same direction. And so we're going to empower people. And our goal is to make everybody responsible for what's going on, to allow you to make some mistakes on your own, but also to allow you to develop and grow and get us all pulling in the same direction. That is true for both the middle management and for the upper management. My view of the most senior fellows, the ones that report to me, is they are being empowered and they are going to be responsible and held accountable for making sure it happens. They're going to look to you to do the same. The goal is fairly straightforward. Most of you know we have a morale problem at the moment in this company. The one way to fix morale problems is to make money, to be successful. We have a game plan that can be successful. Nearly everyone who's reviewed it thinks it will be. I think it will be, and I hope you do as well. It is my sincere hope that you will join me in making sure that it is successful. If we work together, we will all profit together. And that has got to be our goal. Thank you for taking the time to watch this tape. We hope that the information was both informative and useful to you and allows you to help plan your future and that of your family. From all of those of us at Continental, we expect a bright future. We expect you to share in it. We hope that it will happen very, very quickly. I ask each of you to operate as safely and effectively as possible. I ask you to all try and be cooperative, work in the spirit that we're all trying to accomplish, which is to say, achieving our long-term strategy for our gains so that we can each benefit. Thank you. And thank you.